Remember guys, in the early versions of Windows, they had that game. It was it was where you were a little guy and you were skiing down a hill and sometimes the the Yeti ate you. It was um it was called um Man Ski, right? No. Man's Sky. Hey guys, it's Paul, combat veteran, MMA fighter, YouTuber. I can't even take myself seriously anymore. Uh, but we are here, and we are going to be breaking down a, well, a member-requested video. This is the Engoodening of No Man's Sky Part 2 from our friend, Internet Historian. Let's, uh, let's get into it. In Part 1, our heroes... Uh, screwed everything up by over-promising and under-delivering on what was probably considered to be hyped as one of the greatest games of the generation. The year is 2000 AD. Sean has just graduated from university and is headed into the- Damn, now I get to feel young again because in 2000 I was 13? big wide world. He rises up the ranks at a number of studios, eventually working as a technical lead for Black and technical director for Burnout 3. When Burnout's developer is bought by EA, he is in his late 20s. And he... Mm, well, any story that prominently features EA early on Probably not gonna end well. He and three of his buddies decide to leave and start their own studio. Hello Games. This was a risky venture. Uh, so we've done this incredibly foolish thing of like quitting our jobs and then we had to sit down and try and decide what the game was gonna be. Together they create their first title, Joe Danger. They work on this game day and night. In fact, even once they were arrested in their own office because the police thought they were there to rob the place. Because who would be working at 11 p.m. on a Sunday night? Mmm, those damn government bureaucrats don't know the meaning of work. I'm kidding, I'm a government bureaucrat, obviously. But they had to work that hard. Like any startup, it was a huge financial and professional risk. They had no income. They were working in a tiny room above an old tile shop, living off savings. And to keep the project running, Sean even- I just love the internet historian, like deliberately has everything be incredibly low res. Sold his house. So we made a really tough and probably at the time seemed really foolish decision. Um, it's kind of almost embarrassing for me to talk about. Uh, I sold my house and just basically went all in and Okay, guys, I'm just going to, all right, I don't know about the UK, but I'm going to give you guys a hint about U.S. bankruptcy law. Uh, you're right. That's what you came here for. You thought you were going to get funny internet historian and buckle up because you're going into the U.S. bankruptcy court. So <laughs> the reason this is so dumb is because it was completely unnecessary. So here's how this works. You found a company and... In the, um, in the United States, right? I, I have no idea how this works in the UK. Maybe it makes perfect sense in the UK, but, but I, I don't think it does. I think UK broadly will have the same structures. So you form an LLC, and that LLC is in a lot of ways its own independent entity from you, the person, right? And so that LLC can go out like every startup on earth. It can go to investors or banks with its hat in its hand and say, hey, I want a loan. Just like if I wanted to open a McDonald's or a 7-Eleven, right, I would go to a bank and I'd say, hey, I want to open a McDonald's franchise, but to do so, I need a loan of $2 million. And you explain to the bank why you think it's a good idea, why you think that a McDonald's at this intersection is going to do really well, and that the $2 million will let you build the building or refurbish it, order the supplies, right? Buy your franchise license, etc. And the bank will say, yep, we agree. No, we don't. And usually there's an interest payment, a, a, an interest rate attached to that loan that you're expected to pay back once the business is up and running, right? The other way is, of course, to do it the venture capital way and to find investors who buy a share of the future profits as co-owners in the venture, 
right? And that is something where it's like, again, like a tech startup, you go, oh, my app is gonna build McDonald's franchises with the push of a button. And you go to different rich people and you ask them to give you money in exchange for shares of the company, All right? But let's say your company gets totally and completely run into the dirt. Let's say you're the worst McDonald's manager of all time. Well, in both cases, the company's assets will get divided up and, and you will file for bankruptcy because you've run your company out of money. And among all the people your company owes money to, those assets will get divided up among the people with claims, right? Usually it goes first to debt holders, people that loaned you money for an interest rate, and then remaining claims are paid out to your, your investors, right? If, if there's anything remaining. And again, if you're bankrupt, there probably isn't going to be. But crucially, unless you have committed some like pretty brazen financial fraud, they will not, the courts and your creditors will not come after you, your house, your personal car, anything that is yours personally, um, they will not go after you right? That money is yours and remains yours. Obviously, there's exceptions. You can't just like commit blatant comical fraud, get a loan for $2 million, put up your McDonald's in a, in a shack from Home Depot, and then pocket $1.8 million. And, you know, right, if it's like fraud, they're going to they're gonna go after your stuff. Um, but a point of this is that if you're making a game and you're an experienced developer and you have a good team and your product is nearing completion and you need some extra cash for let's say your marketing budget why would you take money from your personal account which is protected money that is sheltered from bankruptcy even here's the crazy thing even if you personally declare bankruptcy they will not they will do the same basic process, right? The courts will come in. They'll look at everyone you owe money to. They will find all the assets you have, and they will agree to a distribution of your assets, right? So no one will get paid off entirely, but everyone will get paid off a little. Um, but the courts have said, we're not going to take the place that you live, so your primary residence, and we're not going to take your retirement accounts. So people who sell their primary residence or drain their retirement accounts, retirement accounts to pay debt are idiots. They're not idiots. It's it's a I understand where it comes from. It comes from fear, it comes from panic, it comes from a sense of dread. Um, but those people, before you do so, should have should spend, you know, swipe their credit card one more time and hire a CPA or a bankruptcy attorney to talk you through what you can and cannot sell to pay your creditors. So anyway, all this to say, the reason it is dumb is because what he should have done is gone to other banks and been like, hey, I need $50,000. I need $100,000 to sell my game. I will pay it back. I just need a marketing budget. Here's the reasons it's successful. The game is almost done. We are all experienced developers. We think there's a market for this reason, right? And yeah, sure, you've got to pay the bank back, but this was in like 2000 and what, 10, 2012? Interest rates were peanuts, right? I mean, they were, they, they're lower now, incredibly, but they were really low then. So banks should have been happy to write this guy a check, and he wouldn't have had to sell his family's shelter out from under them. So that's why it was really stupid and funded what we were doing, which is not something I would recommend anyone else do. But by June 8th, 2010, they had done it. The game was good. And they could breathe a sigh of relief, because on the very first day it hit the PlayStation Store, they made their money back. Two years later, Joe Danger 2 was released. It was not the commercial success they had hoped for, and they didn't want to just keep pumping out sequels. That was a trap big players in the industry had fallen into. I mean... If it's easy, right, you have the models and stuff, to me, to me, some of it is just like, hey, if it's profitable, you can do it again, right? Um, the, Devin Nash has a really good video on sort of the beginner's mind as it applies to uh, being a, a entrepreneurial creator. And he talks about the fact that it's like sometimes you don't have to fully understand why a thing works. 
you don't have to constrain yourself to being like, we have to do things in this way and it's in a little box, right? So if making Joe Danger 2 is relatively easy, though it took him two years, um, maybe you don't need to, you know, roll out, maybe you don't need to stop making out Joe Dangers 2, 3, and 4, right? Even maybe you could just license the franchise to help fund your other projects. In his spare time, Sean started working on a prototype for a procedurally generated game. They took another gamble and scrambled to get a trailer out in time to present at VGX 2013. So the project is official now, and the pressure is on. Around this time, Sean is also looking to start a family. Concurrent to all this development, he would go on to have three kids. So the weight of responsibility is really piling on. Mmm, yeah. But the, their hard work will pay off, as they're finally going to have a chance for some R&R &R around Christmas. They woke up to find their homes flooded, their cars submerged, and their plans for Christmas Day very much ruined. Bad news. Rain. Rain and flooding in the south of England, right around the Hello Games office. Oh man. They are completely inundated and they return from their holidays to find laptops floating around at waist height. But some good news, they hadn't lost any data. So they pull together, soldier on. Sony offered them resources to help them recover from the floods and scale up production, but the offer was declined. Interesting. That's that's an interesting um, effort. I'm curious. Uh, yeah, sometimes it's funny. On one hand, it could be a case of corporate speak not translating to like small programmer speak, right? They may not understand that that like when a corporation makes that offer, it's one thing. It's way different than if your friends are like, do you need me to come by and help you clean up, Joe? And you're like, don't worry about it. We got it, buddy. And like deep down, you're like, I'm going to spend two days here cleaning this up. But if I have to spend two days cleaning it up and listen to, you know, annoying Mike from next door, like I'm going to lose my mind. And so you say no. But like when a corporation does it, it's because they think it's profitable for them in the long term to spend that money. And like the crazy thing is, Sony's pockets are so deep that it would be like trivial to them to like double, triple the size of your studio, right? When like a big corporation offers you money, especially when there's like not a lot of strings attached, you should probably just take it. If there's strings attached, don't. But, you know, usually it's because they think there's going to be a profit on the back end. And if it's clear that the, the, if it's clear how they're making their money on the back end, then yeah. You, you, you fail to appreciate, like, a lot of money to you is, like, nothing to a multinational like Sony, you know? The difference between a million dollars and a hundred thousand is, like, nothing to them. Development continue. Believe it or not, okay, there's this type of scam. The fact that this works is unbelievable, but you can Google it. People have used it on Google, Facebook, almost every corporation. Literally, the scam is that they send a like comically cheap product to the company. An example might be uh, a CD-ROM with the manuals of, of servers that they think Google uses, like PDFs on it, right? Something that you could find on the Oracle's website, just downloaded, burned onto a CD, mailed to Google offices. Google will almost certainly throw it directly in the trash, but then you send them an invoice that says server technical contract support, something that sounds legit, right? Again, these are, th you can Google this. This has really happened at numerous companies. You send them an invoice for like $30,000, $40,000, and payroll doesn't know what it is, but the company is so big that they would struggle to find who actually contracted out this server support services, and they don't know. They're they're too lost in the sauce to do it. And so the scam, which is highly illegal, uh, is that these invoices get paid. Payroll just says, yeah, server support, this sounds about right. They might even call them and be like, hey, do you guys have a contractor who supports the servers? And that's almost certainly correct at every major company. So 
40, 50, 60 thousand dollars. There's someone who scammed Google and Facebook for like a hundred thousand dollars, right? Like truly incredible money. Let me see if I can open this up because this is like too wild to even talk about. Uh, let's see, I think it's Facebook fake invoice scam. Oh, buckle up. Oh, oh wow. Guys, buckle up for this number. Yeah, this is NPR, so you know it's probably legit. Pete's guilty to phishing scheme that fleeced Facebook Google out of $100 million. Elaborate scheme involving fake company, fake emails, fake invoices. It's not that elaborate. Setting up Quanta Computer, right, in Latvia. Or to have general confusion. And paying tens of million dollars in fraudulent bills from 2013 to 2015. So they got from Google and Facebook hundreds of millions in 24 months. This is wild, right? Wild. 20, 98 million from Facebook in 2015. Wow. Here's the crazy thing. Man, if you, you just you just got to not get greedy. Like face, here's the thing. Facebook wouldn't have cared if it was like $900,000. Wouldn't have even been on their radar. News. So there they are. So anyway, what's the point of all this? Uh, the point of all this is to say is that companies, corporations are so rich so incredibly rich that they can afford that that like they could have afforded to completely ramp up revamp and totally change uh totally change the outcome of this no man's sky thing right at that point working in a damp office and then ding dong Ooh, who's at the door it's danish mathematician dr johan gillis he's seen the game and he says they are using my super formula in perfect English, and there is a potential for a lawsuit. Sean says they didn't, and he could prove it. So they have a meeting, and the claim is eventually dropped. Lawsuit evaded. So back to work, guys. Ding dong. It's Sky Television. They've seen the game. You are infringing on our Sky trademark. They said in perfect text-to-speech. They had succeeded in getting Microsoft to change SkyDrive to OneDrive, and they were about to give gamers No Man's One under threat of lawsuit. But this lawsuit didn't just go away. The threat loomed over them for the next three years. Yeah, the, the ability of, like, this is another great, uh, by great, I mean dirtbag scheme, right? And you can see a company like Sky TV is trying to run it, right? No one... No reasonable person is going to confuse No Man's Sky, the video game, with Sky Television, the media company, right? And so, but Sky, right, Sky TV knows that they can, one, if, if the company just ignores it, they can actually win a lawsuit just by your, your other party no-showing, no right, for a court date. And so... You know, you could potentially take ownership of this extremely hyped up uh, game, right? And B, you can cost enough money to defend this. Because remember, Sky TV hires their own lawyers. They have lawyers in-house that they're going to pay whether they work on 100 cases or on zero. So it doesn't really cost Sky TV a ton of extra money to file a lawsuit. In contrast, a five-person dev studio is going to have to roll out a lot, a lot of resources to fight a lawsuit. Again, lawyers are not cheap, and as discussed, these guys are already kind of broke. And so some of it is probably just to go up and, shuffle, and shake the tree and try to get a payout. Try to be like, hey, how much would you spend on lawyers? $100,000? Hey, for 50 Gs, we'll drop this lawsuit in an out-of-court settlement. Is it extortion? Basically, right? They say, we finally settled with Sky. They own the word Sky, which is not true because lots of movies and films released in the UK have the word Sky in it. Um, we can call our game No Man's Sky. Three years of secret, stupid, legal nonsense over. Yeah. Right up until the month before release. So they get back to work and ding dong. It's Sony with some good news for once. We and here's the problem. I bet their lawyers told them this. You can't just give in to Sky because then whoever owns man and no or your new title, right? You think if they called it no man's one, then Microsoft will sue them for confusing it with OneDrive. You see what I mean? 
You like a game, kid? We want to feature it front and center and make you a big star. This could mean millions of dollars in additional revenue. They said, yeah. But along with it, a lot of press for this game would need to be done. Being a small team, they didn't have anyone for PR. They had their designers, they had their developers, and that was about it. So it's up to Murray. Sean is in his early 30s now. Not super young, but relatively young and inexperienced for this type of media circuit. This deal with Sony put extra pressure on them. It set deadlines. It's not that it's Sony's fault, but they're locked in now with much less flexibility. So when May rolls around and they have no option but to delay, even if they wanted to ask for an extra 6 to 12 months of development, which they really need, it's probably too much to ask for. So they extend from late June to August. Only six weeks. From here, you can predict what's going to happen to multiplayer and a bunch of other promised features. So here's the other thing that I think is really important, and, and this is kind of something that I learned recently, is that startups, in startups, it's completely normal to sell a product which is not yet finalized, which is not yet complete, in a lot of ways not yet even really built out. Right, you can you sell a conceptual product and you get a, pr a handshake agreement that you're gonna accept it, but the product doesn't actually yet exist, right? And so that is important because that probably felt normal to someone like Sean Murray to sit there and go, "Can is it possible to procedurally generate a planet?" Of course, it seems totally feasible. Is it possible to procedurally generate, you know? Uh, day-night cycles that are different based on rotations. Yes, right? It's totally possible to do these things. Everything he promised was completely within the realm of possibility, right? It just became a problem when it, 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 the level of promise started to run up against the deadline. But from what it sounds like, it sounds like he made promises when there was no real deadline, when they would have had the extra year to two years to work everything out. Right? When they brought on Sony, this is where they sort of failed. It seems like, based on this sort of partial history, it seems like the flaw was when they brought on Sony and they didn't tell Sony, listen, we need to be scaled up in the next basically 60 days to a triple A studio if you want us to make this release, release date. Right? It's like cheap. Um, you can make the game on the cheap with a small team. And you can make it good, but it won't get be fast, right? But if you want it, but if you want it to be fast and good, you have to spend a lot of money, right? You can't do it all. So here's how the hype happened. Scope of game, time. And here's the line which shows the reality of development. Progress is steady and ends in August 2016. Now here is the line of player expectations. It should start out here and follow along the purple. But the overhyping trailer comes out and puts us way up here. This is special. In this trailer, it features a bunch of things that Hello Games thinks they're capable of having in the game by 2016. Totally normal for a startup. That's the first big mistake. Then it's announced for PlayStation and it costs $60 and there's a collector's edition. Second, even bigger mistake. That puts us all the way up here. And I think this is the main problem, because price tags set expectations. For a $60 game, this was seriously barren and disappointing. Right, this is the problem. At 60 bucks a pop, Sony needed to give them a AAA team underneath them. Now, if they had put it out for $20 as an indie game or an alpha, no problem. That's, that actually is the Escape from Tarkov method. The Escape from Tarkov is technically, I think, still in beta. And so... Like, they tell you very clearly when you sign up that this game is is a beta, and you are a beta tester, right? And it's been in beta for, like, two years. And it's it, to me, it's really good because it had a lot of polish. But, yeah, there were bugs. But ultimately, and people, you know, have this the normal level of salt about bugs. But because no one created the expectation that it was a triple-A finalized game... Nobody is really that salty that there were weekly patches, bugs, things were getting nerfed and rebalanced, 
right? Or that it only had like four maps when it debuted. But when they gave it the triple A treatment, people rightfully aligned their expectations with other games in that category. That is the main reason customers' expectations were so skewed. Then Murray went to interviews, exacerbating the problem. Every time he mentioned a feature in the game, even in passing, fans set their expectations to triple A heights for that feature. Now, some people think the interviews are the main problem. In my humble opinion, not so much. Most people never saw these interviews. It's not that rickety 12-foot ladder Sean's standing on that's the main problem. It's the 900-foot building he's perched it on in the first place. So the obvious solution here would be an official statement. Hey guys, look, don't expect a 10 out of 10. Expect more of a 5 out of 10. No, the publisher just sank an enormous investment of marketing and opportunity into the game. What's wrong with you? And that would- Right, this is the problem. They, they, they have no problem spending marketing dollars, right? But they have a real problem spending development dollars. And ultimately, development dollars are what really get you a good game. Be a huge middle finger to them. The publisher isn't going to make you hype the shit out of your game, but you can't talk it down either. So, he's kind of stuck up there. In some ways, during the interview, he tries to temper expectations, but it's limited. Can you build a space station? No. He can find one clip of that. But let's not gloss over the interviews. Sean is a technical guy. He's a developer. He's also the introverted type. And the big lights and the stuff on camera does not come naturally to him. Is it super nerve-wracking to talk on stage at E3? Uh, yes. I mean, here's th this is one of the other things that really was like a misstep. To have a PR guy, why would you pull your creative lead to be this PR guy for your company? You know, have have someone else, any hire someone else to do this sort of thing, right? To protect your t technical team. I've talked about this in the other video, but it still really bothers me that they had the backing of Sony and Sony thought they were going to just make a bunch of money with no effort because they had found some wonderkind. But like, you, you, this isn't how this works. <laughs> yes, definitely. I personally find going on stage at E3 like the hardest thing I've ever done. That's something that I would have had in a nightmare before. You know what I mean? It's literally the hardest th thing you've ever done. Yeah, yeah. Still. He stepped up and took interviews for his game from 2013 to 2016. And the main thing people wanted to hear about were the features. Can you have more than so every planet? Will there be wormholes? Right. At what point do you get do you get points or anything? From these interviews. It's on Stephen Colbert. Yeah, as an introvert, that sounds terrifying. And as someone who has lots of better things to do, it's also kind of a waste of your time, right? Like, why would you take someone who's right? Sean Murray has eight hours in a day. 12 if you're a managing director dev, right? Why not spend that 12 hours doing what he absolutely does best, which is supervising his team and getting this game out the door? And instead, you're diverting... Remember, when he was on Stephen Colbert, there was... Yeah, he was on for an hour. He spent two hours in hair, makeup, and, and getting, like, prepped. He probably spent another two or three hours getting uh, pre-interview prepped, like going over talking points and stuff. He would have had to transit to New York from the UK. So you're talking an, uh, basically eight hours, a full travel day. So you're talking about, tw you know, let's let's say generously two full working days of time to do something that he himself is like, I am terrible at this. It would have been completely worth it to just be like, hey, we're going to hire a PR person. They are going to handle all the external communications, right? Find someone with a little bit of dev expertise. Sony probably already has someone in-house that they could just assign. Be like, hey, we're sending you to England. You're going to work with this team. You're going to help them hype and sell this game. Like, and you're going to make 30,000 pounds a year. Thanks so much, right? It may not even cost them anything more. They could just send one of their existing PR people to be like, okay, here's your big test. People took Sean to be a liar a Peter Molyneux or a chess club member out to sell his game at whatever reputational cost. But I think the truth is more complicated than that. Sean and the team are indie developers working on a new IP. Their project and plans are constantly in flux. 
they have no idea how large chunks of the game are going to look, especially not a couple of years out from release. And crucially, Sean doesn't understand that something mentioned in 2013, even said in passing, is going to be seen as a promise in the year 2016, even if by then you've decided to cut it from the game. For example, orbiting around the sun. Day has turned it out because the planet has actually rotated on its axis. This originally was in the game, but it caused the player too much confusion. It kept being reported as a bug in the beta, as people left the planet and then returned to find everything different. But nonetheless, into the Lion compilation it goes. So while they're still essentially formulating the game, the media all want a piece of Sean and to report on features first. Conversely, Sean thinks the reporters might help him to temper down things by emphasizing that Hello Games is an indie studio. But that is not how journalism is done. This is how journalism is done. Can you customize the look of your character? Sort of. Full customization confirmed in No Man's Sky. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is sort of the attention economy, right? And it's unfortunate that this was a huge... This was 2014, right? And it's only gotten worse, right? Because your article needs to be clicked on to sell ads. And at the end of the day, that means that you need the most salacious, most attention-grabbing, most clickbaity title possible. And the answer is, of course, you can do excitement or you can do outrage, right? Those are basically your two options. You can get really hyped for something good, but even better is getting really, really outraged over something bad. Anything that puts people into a, a heightened emotional state is going to get you the response that you want. Thank you for this, Internet Historian. This is what I needed this morning periodic table to create atmospheric particles that would diffract light at just the right wavelength. Oh, no. I told you. The press kind of operates downstream from the community because things are click driven as to what stories you get served and things like that. But a rumor would surface from Reddit straight to the front page. There's all this hype and the project has increased in scope dramatically and keeps increasing as the months go by until a point. They are close to the deadline and have to delay, and the reality of what they can achieve in the little time remaining is staring them in the face. They know they're not going to be putting out a finished game. They're worried. There's nothing more they can do. And the fear that they will disappoint the audience is growing on Sean and the team. Um, I, I worry about, like, disappointing people. Upon release, all of these clips are seen as proof that Sean is a liar. And what doesn't help is his body language. I mean, it's kind of the body language of someone who was lying. And this is why I mentioned he's an introvert. Remember, he's a technical lead. Actually, a really good one. But not a salesman. Yeah, I mean, again, imagine being just like an introvert, nerdy guy, and you have to do all these like high-pressure interviews. Dude, that's exactly what I see. I see someone who is painfully uncomfortable Cut him. and like here's the other thing some people deal with these really uncomfortable interactions this is this is why they call them high pressure like car salesmen or high pressure salesmen and that's a technique used to get people to commit to something is when you see someone's uncomfortable right they want to resolve the discomfort as fast as possible and when you're someone who's already really introverted you're on this interview, you know that there's hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of people watching and you have to sit there and, and, and tell them something they don't want to hear. That's so hard to be the bad guy, to be like, no, 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 right? Like, you know Sony's going to call and be mad at you. You know your dev team is going to be mad at you when you go, listen, guys, no. Like, this isn't possible in this game. This isn't possible in this game. This isn't possible. And the level of, like, em embarrassment, you know, the level of discomfort to publicly be like, no, that's incorrect. And to say, I don't appreciate your reporting. Like, you guys reported some things that were exaggerations of the truth, and that wasn't okay, right? To draw these boundaries is, is some requires a level of comfort and a level of what they call poise, and the ability to have a hard conversation and to just like sit there in this this 
I don't want to call it a conflict, but to establish a tension. To be like, you thought this was going to be an interview between friends where we both tell each other things we want to hear. And you're like, actually, it's not. We're going to have a real conversation about some of the things that I said, some of the things that you said, and it's going to be tense. And like, that's hard for non-introverts. There's a lot of extroverts that can't do that, right? So for someone like Sean, who has never given an interview, their instinct is always going to be to appease the person, to relieve any tension through appeasement. And that is usually to sit there and be like, yes, of course this game has X. This game has Y. This game has Z, right? Because he just wants to get out of there. This is how police get fake interrogations, right? They just make it really uncomfortable for the person physically, mentally, and until they eventually will just say what they have to say to get out of there. Just a little bit of slack, because this is simply how he talks. Here are some innocuous questions, and he answers them honestly. Uh, lead producers on uh, No Man's Sky? Yeah, I guess I'm a, I'm a developer on it. I suppose the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, creator or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I... Right, this is someone who could... Look, he, he's barely able to state his title right on a softball question this is someone who is never going to give you bad news he's never going to create conflict in an interview he seems like the most conflict avoidant person you could put together i really like making games i don't necessarily love talking about it <laughs> i think you, you did a good even, job even though worry. even though you know you guys are very nice <laughs> no. seriously same body see he's like barely able to even get out that he doesn't like doing press, right? He's barely able to get that out. Like, you really think this guy's gonna be the guy who's like, no, no, now you have to understand, you've overhyped expectations. We can't do it this way. Body language. And Jesus Christ, they have him up on stage and in front of cameras and bright lights and on the goddamn Colbert Report. Try keeping your nerve on that. Nonetheless, free of that context, the clips have him cemented in the community as a liar. So the graph plays out right to release. Yeah, this is the one thing that bothers me sometimes about gaming culture. It's like, and I understand, gamers are young, 18 to 24. I see my demographics. I know that's that's a large portion of the people that watch this, watch this channel. And it, by and large, I think people are reasonable. But you've got to understand, like, people are weird. They're idiosyncratic. And, like, even the most brilliant person you've ever known is still going to be like a person, right? There's only so much you can cobble together of a person. Like there's only just so much raw material to work with, right? You just you, you can't turn them into a hero, right? The, the the Warhammer 40K Primarchs aren't real. There's not really someone who is a perfect, really brilliant commander, warrior, statesman, intellectual, painter. Like you just can't. You, you, with one brain and, and one person, right? You can be like an awesome, I mean... Sean Murray sounds like, honestly, like kind of a renaissance man, a technical genius, someone who can manage teams and like has the vision to draw a game to completion. Like that's an exceptional, exceptional talent, a top 1%, right? And to be able to run a company on top of that, truly like he's in the top 1% in terms of like renaissance thinkers. Um, to be able to successfully do those things. And again, even if you ignore No Man's Sky, he would still be a successful technical lead and dev and CEO, right? So all that to say, to be like, oh, we also expect him to be a PR genius? Come on, guys. Like, let's be, let's be realistic, right? Nobody, you, that person doesn't exist. Maybe, they, maybe that person exists, but they are either so idiosyncratic, right? Either they have some other flaw that's dragging them down. They would want nothing to do with any of this, right? Because they would correctly identify that it was probably a no-win situation. Or they are making gajillions and gajillions of dollars as like the head of like a AAA studio, right? And that graph, it's actually a track. And that track is what the hype train choo, runs choo, on. Choo, choo. So it comes barreling up the hill. Instead of neatly pulling into the station, it comes crashing right through the roof. The disaster unfolds. They are absolutely shit on. So there were Sean and Hello Games. 
surrounded by the rubble of their former reputation. Punished Sean was at his lowest point. Hated by the- Shout out to the Metal Gear Solid reference. The majority of the gaming community. But they were still alive. And they had made tens of millions of dollars. They were left with two choices. Take the money, start a new project, and be a pariah. A cautionary tale of the industry and hated by the gaming community forever. Or, pick themselves up, get back to work, and with potentially no profit motive, finish the game. It allowed me to do something that I've always done in difficult times, whether it was crappy bosses that I've dealt with before or crappy situations at school growing up. I got my head down, I sat in front of a computer, and I made games, which is what I enjoy. They... I, I just... Okay, I'm just going to point this out as, as just a minor pet peeve. Just a minor pet peeve. I understand that American Sign Language is a awesome tool for deaf people to communicate with one another. But deaf people, by and large, they're literate. They can read. It's a video. It's, it's subtitles. Subtitles, my man. They're automated now. You don't need to hire an ASL interpreter. Picks number two. How why would they play? You can't play. Like, I'm sure, I'm sure there are maybe like a dozen people who enjoy playing AAA rated video games and are deaf and cannot read but are proficient in American Sign Language. I'm sure there's like 10 of those people, but like, for the vast majority, I'm confident that being deaf means you're still literate. Two. Sorry, that's a minor pet peeve that doesn't have anything to do with anything. If there's some other dimension to this, definitely let me know in the comments, right? Like, my understanding is obviously not perfect. So, here's the plan. The team is assigned to fixing bugs and the most obvious problems. Go. Sean tells the team to stop reading all the overwhelmingly negative feedback on the game, and he reroutes all of it to his personal devices. Emails, forum posts, Google News alerts, player feedback, it's all going directly to him now. See, this, that is why he's, I, I stand by my theory. He's a top one percenter. He's a renaissance man. Very few leaders would have the poise and the vision to be like, hey, I have to keep this negativity away from my team. They have to get on the game, on the ball, because they didn't do anything wrong. And even if they did, it doesn't matter because we can't, there's only one way to fix it. And that is to come back right to get back to the grind so the this the vision that these negative press are interfering with their team and the fact that he's ultimately responsible for everything his team doesn't fail to do is like a a a s tier leader move so again i stand by he's not a, he's the worst pr guy on earth but he still probably qualifies as like a renaissance man then he starts breaking that down into data sets People who haven't bought the game, people who have bought it and played it for a hundred hours, people who have returned it, etc. Then he starts compiling those complaints into usable data, focusing on the people with the most sincere experience of the game. Then we start making a big laundry list of all the things that need adding and prioritizing. First thing to fix is that full inventory. Then community mod support. Then a third thing, etc, etc. This is going to take an enormous... Like I said, look at, I mean, that is, that is a, that's a leader, man. That's, a, that is a COO, CEO type of vision, really. Um, that ability to take a subjective problem and turn it into an objective roadmap of, to, to a solution is pretty incredible. Stand by it, man. This is, this is, this is a guy who is brilliant. And, and I think I want to point this out. That next time you hear about someone who is pilloried publicly, right, and seen as an irredeemable, evil, like, no redeeming qualities guy, person, remember this story, right? Because, like, unless the evidence is, is hard, locked in, some of it may just be media hype. Because as we discussed, the media needs to have outrage it needs it to get the to sell the ads that pay their salaries so when you see something that is outrageous in the news 
you should assume that there's probably more to the story, a dimension that you don't understand, a dimension that even often the reporters don't understand, or that the reporters are too overworked, burned out, or pressured to really fully flesh out, right? Just like he was a media darling, then he became a pariah, and in all this time, he's probably a really good leader and a really smart dev. Enormous amount of work to pull off, and they're not going to make the same mistake twice. So they would need to sharply adjust their PR strategy. Anything they said right now, an admission of guilt, I've made a severe, would be met with criticism. Denial, it's not that bad, would be met with criticism. Corporate speak, well, we endeavored to make the best game we could, and we are proud of what we have, would be met with criticism. Half of the problems have been caused by speaking too much. So they were going to do a complete 180. Instead of adding more fuel to the fire, instead of accidentally promising fixes that might also not be delivered, they it's wouldn't desirable. speak to the press Ask again. Female traits you're talking about, I'd say that's a generalization, but you've used They were going to speak to the community directly from now on. So they told the audience they were working on it and went completely silent. One. I mean, if you feel like you got burned by the press and the press cycle, then yeah, I understand why you'd want to just starve, starve the, the, the monster, right? I mean, unfortunately, I've seen a lot, honestly, some of the better reporting that I have seen across all metrics, across all areas now, has been sort of independent reporting, which is scary because that's also the source of some of the worst, right? Um, and it's not fair to force people to have to sift through a gajillion independent reporters to find a good one. Um, but the truth is that, yeah, sometimes you're just like, I can't keep feeding this this hype machine that depends on me being either uh, a, a warrior king hero or an outrageous irredeemable villain. One day passed. No word. Two days. A week. Have you heard from Hello Games? They just had this disastrous release. Nope, haven't seen them. I hope they're working on the game. Two weeks. Dude, are you working on this thing? Just ignore them, just work. Three weeks. Okay, what the fuck is going on? WTF, it's locked. A month. They took the fuck money and ran, didn't they? Didn't say anything, it's not gonna help. Two months. Three months. <laughs> By now, most people were convinced that the game was abandoned. They had made their money. It's all over. Then, after over a hundred days of absolute silence, a tweet. Foundation. The first big patch. It is me, Sean. No, go away, Sean. I am mad at you. <laughs> this, is, this is just great. <laughs> Uh, this is an 80s movie reference for those of you that don't know. A pretty classic John Hughes. I think it's a John Cusack movie. It has been too long, but I bring you gifts. Its accent sucks. <laughs> it brought base building, new game modes, farming, cats, and freighters, as well as a lot of bug fixes. You will have to try harder than that, Sean, to win my love back. It still fell well shy of the promised game. Too little, too late. So Sean left, returned to his team, and got back to work. A few more months went by, and then another tweet. Pathfinder. Intr yeah, <laughs> I'm still laughing at the at the John Hughes movie. You'll have to, you'll have to do more to win my love back. By the way, if um someone ever tells you that their love is something that you must win or earn through, usually through like punishment or providing of, 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 of gifts or certain acts, specific acts, that person is probably some level, you should run, you should run. I'm not going to diagnose them with like a prop, like a problem. Cause obviously I'm not the psychiatrist, but you should run because when someone's like, my love for you is contingent on playing this mini game. Yeah, you, yeah, that's not what a partner does, right? A partner like has your back 
maybe not unconditionally, but through 99% of conditions, right? Like barring her finding, you know, 800 bodies in your basement freezer or something, like you just want someone who loves you to like have your back and not be like, how'd you do on today's dishwasher loading mini game? Do, 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 you know? Yeah. Did you earn enough points for love? Let's find out. Out here. What the fuck? Oh, it's usual. I bring you online base sharing, own multiple starships, starship specialization, multi-tool specialization and classes, permadeath modes, vehicles you can drive around in, and create racetracks for them too with time trials. Look at this. Okay, that's pretty good, but I'm still mad. And there's still a ton promised that isn't in the game yet. So Sean went away once more. A few more months went by. Knock knock. Oh, it's you, Sean. What is it now? I bring you an overhaul to the storyline. New worlds, crashed freighters, space combat, terrain editing, portals, procedural mission system, interstellar trading, and joint exploration. By now, people were really starting to warm to No Man. That's interesting. So 2017, August 31st, 2017. That's that's actually not that far from its release date. In Sky again. And to Hello Games. The game has in many ways exceeded what was promised. It's a substantially better game now. <laughs> no Man's Sky is back, baby! Uh, people saw this was an honest effort to fix the game. And the number of employees working on it was growing. From a studio of 15 to 25. Sean Murray and Hello Games social media also started becoming more active and engaging with the audience. The subreddit was flourishing once more. The price of the game secondhand on Amazon, eBay, and GameStop was going up. The that is pretty interesting. That to me is actually one of the coolest things is to see this secondary market actually do a U-turn uh, as it becomes more and more desirable. Right? I, I love seeing weird economic things like that that behave like in really predictable ways. Then a few more months went by. Next, a really big patch. Oh my god! Holy shit! I just got goosebumps. To be super clear, No Man's Sky is not f that. Here's the full and proper multiplayer experience. Ringed planets, third person mode, character customization, a galactic atlas on an external website for the community, vast overhauls to base building and crafting and resources, and it also brought the game to Xbox. In fact, with the release of Next in July 2018, No Man's Sky was the sixth top selling console game for the month. See, that is I think one of the best, one of the best stories of all this, you know what I mean, is that you can if you offer people a good product, right, they will come to it. Um, it's one of the things that people were surprised about, about the MMO um, that just came out, New World, right? New World, it's a single upfront cost, but they are supposedly going to just like push MMO level updates, right? So without a subscription. Um, and I think they realized that like, I think they realized that the, the, the thing that kind of makes it is you have to have a player base, right? And... If you have that player base, right, and you have to make the game, therefore, easily accessible. A lot of people solve this by making their games free to play, right? Because it's like, why would I would never play Team Fortress 2 if I could never get a match, right? That would be ridiculous. Why would I ever do that? But because there's enough players that you're always getting a match, then, right, it makes, you know, the initial cost of the game is low. And then you have all these cosmetics and other things that you can use to get money, right? So I think that is the like defining the 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 newer business model is to realize that like you can charge an initial fee for the game, then you can have some like cosmetics and non gameplay focused stuff to like get sort of continued revenue from like your whales, and then you can have um, a, a solid player base and a sustaining hardcore group of players that make up most of your revenue. It climbed its way back into Steam's top 10. It reached nearly 100,000 concurrent players. It brought another $24 million across all platforms. 
their STEM rating went from mixed to very positive. People were getting back on board in a big way. But they weren't done yet. Better creatures, weird underwater shit, <laughs> discoveries in bases and environments and equipment, and it keeps going. New biomes, more diversity, archaeology, more things to discover. By now, Sean and the Gaming Inspector personification of the gaming community had li the gaming inspector personification. literally patched things up and were making out on the couch. Which was when he released his biggest patch to date of this video. Oh my god, it's you! Free VR support. Not a whole other game you have to pay for, like some titles. Overhauls to NPCs, tech trees, base building, streamlined multiplayer, ride animals around. All sorts of stuff that was never promised in the first place. And they're still adding more stuff. Someone at Valve, who was a fan of the game, said to me, what you do now is more important than what you say. There is only one thing that's credible, and that's your actions. In fact, I was so slow to get this video out that they put out another patch the other day. With ship salvaging, ship upgrading, more advanced terrain editing, first person exocross, improved VR, improved base building and inventory management, and quality of life stuff. It goes on. Oh, he said something. Is that it was perfect? Funny. Damn it. Uh, technically, there are still things on this spreadsheet missing. But come on now, we're starting to nitpick. Especially when you compare them to relationships with other games companies. They could have gone the route of Fallout 76, mm. paywall mods with Fallout first, charging a monthly fee, a downward spiral more and more into pay to win scraps released without QA testing. But instead, they never added pay to win. They never added microtransactions or paid DLC. They never made VR as a second game. They didn't give up on the game or scale their resources back to do it. They didn't come out and call all gamers entitled. They didn't add loot boxes. They didn't start work on the next big project or sequel. They didn't do much of anything. Ex I mean, this is, w well, I'll let him finish. Except get back to work. And just like that, the game once panned by critics now had awards rolling in. Your developed star 2019. No Man's Sky. Sean Murray. No Man's Sky next. <laughs> and see, I mean, I think this is the story here, is that, like, in this day and age, right, the old way, in the 90s, right, in the early 2000s, when media companies were really centralized, hype or virality didn't really play as big a factor, right? There wasn't a strong medium for non-professionals to cross-pollinate their, their ideas, right? You would have, basically, you could talk to video games about your friends that played video games, um, and that was it. That was it, right? Um, and then, as the internet sort of grew and collected, right, and you would see what was popular, right, at, like, arcades. But here's the thing. The people that decided what games were written about was gaming magazine editors, people that decided what games were featured in arcades were arcade owners, people that decided which games were gonna be in stores were the corporate store management. And so regular people didn't really have a chance to cross-pollinate their information. And so that's why these press junkets became so essential, right, even early on. But now the tide is shifting a lot, right? At the end of the day, my first encounter with Team Fortress 2, a game that has basically made my channel, um, my first first ever encounter was on the subreddit because the subreddit grew so big that it started populating on the, the front page, right? And so when you have that, you're like, you know, Valve didn't pay to get TF2 like memes and stuff on the front page grew because the player base grew and gained momentum more and more and eventually now 12 years after development tf2 is one of the most is is as popular as it has ever been kind of weird no but it's not that weird right so the point is is that turns out sean murray didn't have to do any of that press stuff he could have just made a, a a great game Again, classic example, Escape from Tarkov. They didn't have to pay anyone to do it. They just made a product that was pretty niche and pretty unique and something that no one else was doing. And streamers picked it up, right? They got into it. They started getting good at it. And then their followers started buying it. And the momentum just built and built and built and built, right? Almost no external press. Man, Scott. 
No Man's Sky is next. No Man's Sky. And to cap it all off, the subreddit R No Man's Sky The Game even got together and pulled money for a GoFundMe to have a billboard installed near the Hello Games offices. It must have been a harrowing moment for Sean and the team. They took a huge risk to start a small studio. They clawed their way up to create one of the most notable games of the console generation. Disappointed pretty much everyone with the release and took one of the biggest online beatings in video game history for it. As a family post-release, we faced uh, some really difficult challenges. Everything that you can imagine from like the worst of the internet, we hit. But then over the course of the next three years, completely turned it around and came out the other side with a win. It's the un Yeah, I mean, again, guys, I just want to point this out, right? This is someone who doesn't seem like a bad actor, who seems, again, like a, a really a brilliant, brilliant person and like and, and a great leader, like a true leader of his team. And and I may dive into this in a podcast because it's one of those things that bothers me. But like, look at him in interviews. He seems like the squirreliest, like, like anxious like he just doesn't have any of the traits when you think of leader in your mind he looks nothing like it but he is right the proof is in the pudding i mean look the team stuck around can you imagine being part of one of the biggest failures in gaming history and your loyalty is so tremendous that you don't leave like who and what what is that, right? It's a testament to this guy. And, and so all that to say, right, when you see someone being, like, pilloried for something in the media and on the internet, you should be reasonably certain that it's not a characterization of that person's, like, fundamental moral fiber, or even really an accurate depiction of whether or not they're good at something, right? At, at best, it's, at best, it's the internet's random flavor of the day. That's all it is. That's all it is, right? And, and it's important to remember that. And it's important to remember the converse, right? When you have some, someone who's, like, billed as, like, a great world-conquering mega hero, like, some super, superstar, just assume the same thing. If they're no better or worse, right, than, than anybody else, you know? That the reality is almost always somewhere in the middle. Underdog story. And after doing all of this research, I couldn't help but come to the conclusion that they were the good guys. Gay! So what is the future for Hello Games? In 2017, they announced Hello Labs, a support program focused on original titles and games using procedural generation. Two of the team also branched off to work on a small title called The Last Campfire. But for the foreseeable future, they're just working on No Man's Sky. They'll announce a new game the moment this video goes live. I just know it. <laughs> okay, let's let's just check to see if that is correct, if that is indeed the case, and then we're probably gonna get out of here. All right, Hello Games new game release. Okay, Hello Games: The Last Campfire looks like the most recent one. No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky. Nope. Nope. No new games. No Man's Sky update 3.70. Love it. Expedition 4 emergence. 13, 13 hours ago. <laughs> Dude, nice. Oh my god. Expedition 4 emergence. How guys should brand new update for No Man. Oh, Expedition 4 emergence. Maybe that's their game? Or no, no, that's probably the patch and that this is like the update. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. This is great. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you guys so much for recommending this video to me. Um, I love a good comeback story, and um, you know, I, I love, I love the fact that you know, if we take an hour, we can go from something that was a simple narrative, right, and peel back some layers and realize, hey, actually, the narrative was way more complex under the surface, right, and. 
even internet historian acknowledges there's a lot more to this story that he wasn't party to. He had to just make his best guess. And so to me, I think we should all carry this forward when we hear a story in which there is a, a you know, evil villain twirling his mustache, you know, or a noble hero who can do no wrong, right? You should always approach those with a grain of salt because the truth is more complicated. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining me on this journey. Um, first off, big thanks to the channel members who recommended this video. Um, if you want to become a channel member, that's the join button right next to the subscribe button. It is a great way to support the channel, and it's like $3.99 a month. Like, I try to keep it, you know, like, Starbucks latte, not even. A Starbucks latte is like six bucks now. Um, but I try to make it affordable, and you get exclusive rooms on the Discord, right, that I'm always in. Uh, though the Discord largely is free, and you should join, link in the description. Um, it lets you submit requests for videos, vote on this week's, on my Friday reaction video, and when I stream multiplayer games, gives you priority to join my party. <laughs> So all that to say, guys, it's definitely worth it. Also, be sure to check out the podcast, The Combat Veteran Breakdown. And I think that's it. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.